start recording. There we go. So in Matthew 25, yeah, we were looking at two parables. First one was the parable of the talents. And then we had the separation of the sheep and the lambs, those, you know, uh, who did unto the least of these. Um, and then we also had in the beginning of Matthew chapter 26, that story of a, of a, Jesus getting anointed um, with the costly uh, appointment by the woman and Judas's betrayal. So any other thoughts, follow-ups, anything stick with you throughout the week uh, about those texts? I was just wondering um, when I was reading through it this morning again, the woman that um, had the ointment and poured it on Jesus, it was that something that would they would have done routinely to somebody, or was this like wow she knew what was going to happen because he said you know she's prepared me for my burial. Is she somehow was she keyed into that somehow, or or was that kind of a man? That is a great question. I'm. I'm not honestly familiar, Dan. Um, I mean, I know that preparing sick bodies for burial was a thing and that anointing was something that you would do um, for either um, royalty uh, or, or for um, those who were getting ready to do a, um, a great deed, a, a difficult trial. Um, you know, and, and that might be facing your own death, um, you know, or, or going into a battle that you knew that you were greatly outnumbered or something like that, facing significant odds um, on behalf of others. Um, it almost seems like she might have, like, been traveling around with them for a while or, or you know, knew more than just all of a sudden she appears and dumps the soil on him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he, I think that's such a good reminder that even though, because these texts were written by men, focusing mostly on men. And, you know, sometimes what your focus is on is what you see, and you don't always see the big picture if you're not focused on it. Uh, yeah, I'm sure, uh, I think it's likely. I think well, you're right. My commentary, when John, my commentary leads me over to John, and he identifies her as Mary. That yeah. Mary took the pound of costume perfume and um, perform, poured it on him. And, so, and, that, and then my commentary also says that she obviously had listened to his mm -hmm. predictions and foretelling and, and believed it, whereas the disciples, you know, they didn't want to talk about that. But yeah, I mean, it just says in John 12, 3, it says that Mary took the pound of costly perfume and anointed his feet. Yeah, and, and this is interesting because the Gospel of John, you know, they call the, they, they call the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they call them the synoptics because they all have similar source material. You know, Mark was the first one written. It's the briefest. And then Matthew and Luke take a lot of their stuff from the same source material of Mark, but then they add in their own things. Um, but John seems to get a whole bunch of his stuff from a separate, it's very, very different. Um, and so, yeah, some scholars will say that, yes, this is Mary, um, as, as, it is, as Mary is portrayed in the Gospel of John. And some say that, like, John was so focused on something different that was happening that this could have been an entirely different woman. So whether, I mean, yeah, it very likely could have been Mary. It could have been another woman who was a part of uh, Jesus's entourage and um, her his his disciples. Um, but yeah. could have been another Mary. We don't know about. <laughs> it could have been. Man, there were so many yeah, Marys. Exactly. Man, like Marys and Johns and Simons. Oh boy! Oh boy! Yeah. That was before the Catholic Catholic Church. <laughs> <laughs> right. right even before i mean hey mary it's, it's tough to beat that name that's when you when in i still love you know we'll get there in um you know advent as we're thinking about mary jesus's mother it's tough to beat 
having the title, at least in the Orthodox Church, of Mary, Mother of God, it's kind of tough to beat that. That's a pretty cool title and a pretty great name. So, you know, I mean, I'm just named after the guy who got stoned and martyred first. So I, I don't know that I'm really that, ex you know, so, hey, Mary could have been a good one. I don't know. <laughs> But hey, let's, let's continue on uh, in chapter 26. Um, so we're, we're going to, you know, I encouraged you last week, if you can, to kind of read some of the other stuff, um, because we're not going to read all of it, because uh, it's a very, very long chapter. But um, would somebody be willing to read Matthew 26, verse 17 through 25, and someone else read 26 through 30. I can start. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the 12. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, <clears throat> surely not I, Lord. Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus answered, Yes, it is you. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to all of them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for, the, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. <clears throat> So first of all, I wish I knew what that hymn was. <laughs> <laughs> I love hymns, and we don't we don't even get to know what this hymn is. That's you know, it's probably a psalm, um, but but uh, yeah, we don't we don't even get to hear what it is. So what's the so what's the setting of this space? Other than Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper up in some room <laughs> with one really long table where you're only allowed to sit on one side. On one side, yeah. <laughs> Got to pose for the picture. What's the occasion for this dinner? Passover. Passover. Mm -hmm. All right, and remind us what what is what is the religious holiday of Passover? What what is what are we remembering? If I remember rightly, you had to mark something on the doorway so the specter of death wouldn't enter your house. Is that right? You, you're you're on to it. Good. What else? What is it connected to? So what? Why the the whole specter of death? What's that connected to? Or when did they yeah. first do that? I think it was when they were in Egypt or getting ready, either getting ready to leave Egypt or something like that. Yeah, this would be the 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 tenth plague. And this was the one that the people of Israel were cued in on, that, um, that there would be the death of the firstborn son, uh, of the firstborn sons. Um, also something I'd never thought about. Um, that's interesting, that on a remembrance of the death of firstborn sons, um, of God creating new things, even in the midst of death. Um, but... But yeah, it's a remembrance of Passover, of God's liberation of the people of Israel out of Egypt, out of slavery. Um, and so it's a chance. So they're, they're in the middle of this. Has anybody ever had the chance to do a Passover Seder? 
How, how would you, Diane, can you describe that a bit for us? Would you be willing to share? You know, because of the telemarketers, but if you leave your name. Oh, I was like, is he talking? Don't. He's got the best voicemail, the best. best. Yeah, we had a, um, we had a converted Jew um, friend of ours and he invited us. I mean, it was the whole, I mean, he had cooked all day and done the whole, um, well, actually I've been to two. I've been to one in a home where he, you know, did the, I mean, um, you know, they get rid of all the leaven and, 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 but anyway, and we sat on the floor and we had the whole meal. It was very cool, very quiet. And, um, you know, and then they have the, and I don't ask me what all the things are on the Seder plate. And I, rem I just remember the, the egg <laughs> and that nobody could tell us what the egg was for, but then the bitter herbs and the, um, um, what else is on there? Anyway, we had all the different little, we have a Seder plate I got from that actually that day. And it has the, all the little sections that they put different things around it. But then, I mean, the whole thing is very quiet. You know, he had candles and um, then there's a time where they open the door and Elijah comes in or something like that. I can't remember. It's been a long time. Um, but then I, that one, would, like I said, was at a friend's house. And then, um, then, I, we did one at a church, I think it was in Omaha, actually, um, that actually did one. I mean, it was huge. It was massive. Um, and you could go and then um, yeah, I, but I, I just, the egg stands out to me because they couldn't remember. Nobody could tell us what the egg was for. It was just, it's always been there. <laughs> but anyway, but it was very close. It's very, um, you know, very ritualistic, obviously, but um, seemed to really mean a lot to to those that were participating in it. Yeah, so it's it's a meal that includes like multiple courses, and in the 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 food correlates with the memories, and uh, there is there is storytelling. You know, the scripture comes alive, and the all the participants are brought into it anew. Um, you know, and so it's very much for those of us. Uh, who are Christians, you know, Jesus is almost creating uh, a new sort of Passover here, a new time where you have elements of food and meals that bring people together and put us apart of God's story of uh, liberation and recreation. Um, and it's also a good <laughs> reminder, I love that <laughs> story of the egg, Diane, because it's also a good reminder that a symbol is only as good as you know what it's pointing to. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, how many, how many Christians, if, if somebody, you know, if somebody who had no idea of Christianity and came into a, a church or a holy space or sat through a worship and, you know, turned to one of us and said, so wait, why do you guys do this? And what's this about? And what does this mean? And that, you know, I'm sure there's something that, that would even, that would get all of us, myself included, to be like, I don't know. I don't know why we do that. That's a good, that's a good question. Why do we do that? <laughs> so it's a good reminder. So they have this, this, it's, it's a beautiful night. It is solemn, as Diane said, it's a solemn night, but it's also, there's still that, that joy of, of, you know, God brings us through and, um, and yet Jesus just instantly turns this into the most awkward Passover ever uh, because the moment they sat down he says truly I tell you one of you will betray me uh, and and they have to go through the rest of the Passover <laughs> together uh, I cannot imagine that have you ever been in like a social setting where there was no way out of it like you were there and it was just so awkward <laughs> this election stuff <laughs> oh Somebody my lord and it's like okay we're not going to talk about it but it's always the elephant in the room <laughs> yeah. on at least this year for better or for worse you know if if you're worried about election conversations around the holidays sorry covid we can't get together we're just gonna have to <laughs> social distance yeah. we'll catch you next year <laughs> see how things pan out but yeah, I mean, yes, oftentimes for, for uh, you know, uh, politics can be one of those things that, that separates us. Um, 
Yeah. Um, but let's let's focus in on because these are so important of words. These verses twenty six uh, and through twenty nine, what we call Jesus's words of institution. I, I just want to focus on this for a bit to to just um, ask you what what do they what do you think Jesus is saying to the disciples, uh, and what what how have you heard those words? previously in communion and, and how might they connect or, or how do they mean something different? How do you think they could connect and how might they mean something different? Well, can I go back just a few verses before that, just because I read it early. I was doing what um, I was just reading over it this morning and a couple of things I had never really thought about before, but um, at least the commentary I was reading when he said, whoever, dips with me is the one that betrays me and the commentary I was reading was like they all dipped with him so that wasn't he wasn't necessarily pointing out Judas at that point that it was more he his point was this is a friend that is betraying me this is somebody I you know I've loved and been a part of and everything so it wasn't and he, like I said I've never even read that part of a commentary before and I don't know what that but that but it was talking of focusing on how the hurt that had to have been for him that this was one of his disciples that was going to betray him um and there was another point i can't remember what it was oh and just the fact that the disciples were all like is it is it i is it you know they didn't just automatically assume it was judas so they must have had a all had a uh you know a good oh, relationship gosh. You know, but that they were all asking, is it me? Is it me? Is it me? But anyway, but we can go and focus on the scriptures you were. No, talking. no, no, no. But I, I love that. Like, I think that's a good point. Like, um, I think it's so easy to read the gospels with an expectation that like, we are, you know, we know how the story is going to end. So yeah. both we can kind of skip over the stuff we don't like, but we can also just say, oh, well, we know who the bad guy is. Uh, you know, we can pin it all on Judas and be gone. And But the fact that none of them knew if, if they were capable of being the one that betrayed right. Jesus. Right. Um, and also none of them were like, oh, yeah, that's totally Judas. Right. <laughs> You know, I mean, I think I've always looked at it that way. I always thought, you know, he dipped it and handed it to Judas and everybody knew then. And that's not necessarily how it happened that they, you know, everybody dipped with him. Yeah, so that's what it says is, you know, someone who dipped, put their hand in the bowl is going to betray me. He didn't indicate who it was at that point in time. Right. And notice <laughs> that so as we turn to the words of institution that even after he names judas as betraying and then in matthew that's the matthew's the only one i believe that actually has the the woe to you you know it would have been better for you if not to have been born yeah um, harsh yeah. harsh words out uh and yet jesus when he does his words of institution invites everyone eat of this bread, all of you, drink of this cup, all of you. Um, so there's, so even, even when Jesus says it, it's, you've done such a heinous act that it would be better that if you weren't born, you're still connected to Christ. You are still welcome at Jesus's table. Um, I, and to me, that's like the most powerful, challenging thing. I'm, I always kind of struggle with that woe to you been better if you hadn't been born in that, um, you know, the harshness of that when you first read it, Jesus is kind of like condemning. It comes across that way to me. And when I read it this morning, you know, I, I was able to maybe consider a different um, take on it in that, he actually, maybe Jesus had understanding and compassion for Judas, knowing what Judas, the guilt he's going to have, and the self-incrimination or whatever, you know, because Judas went out and supposedly committed suicide and stuff like that. And so maybe Jesus is like, I feel so sorry for you, 
woe to you. It might have been better if you hadn't been born because of what you're going to go through. Not necessarily I, I'm condemning you, you know, for what you did. I don't know I if that makes that. sense. I love that. I think that's a good, you know, I mean, so even then, you know, maybe Jesus is knowing, is, is showing compassion. Uh, I, I like that take on it. And I think that's, you know, I, I think that's a good, um, a good reminder. And, you know, for me, as somebody who, who likes to fix it, um, sometimes there's some brokenness in this world that we cannot fix, but we can try and find healthy relationships and we can try to still have compassion and still pray for one another, even if we can't fix it for someone else. Um, so I, I, I think that's a great reminder of his relationship with Judas <laughs> in those words. Um, so what, so, so let's talk just a little bit about the, anything about the words of institution? Do those, do those words connect with you or is there anything about them that jumps out at you? I think we get kind of, I don't know if complacent is the right word. Sometimes they're kind of rote. You kind of, it's like you hear them over and over and over again. And sometimes I have to just really stop when I am partaking of communion, Lord's Supper, um, to really think about what those words mean. Because, you know, I just think we get in such a ritual of just doing it. At least I know as a child I did, we just, you know. Um, and then I had friends who were Catholic as an adult, you know, who, you know, they really think about the blood and the body. And, you know, and of course they go to the extreme of, they did. I think that's changed now. You know, they put the wafer on their tongue and you can't touch it with your teeth. And, and, you know, there's, because it is so holy to them. So, well, there, there is still, so I, I think you're right. So there is, you know, I mean, and this is where I know for those of us who have been raised in disciples traditions or what you would call low Eucharistic traditions, places where the, and communities where like the, the elements of the juice and the bread or, or the wine and the bread um, where they, they are more symbolic uh, than actual. Um, and, and we don't always, I don't know, I hear disciples all the time who like maybe have relatives who are Catholic and go to the Catholic church and they're like, but I couldn't take communion. It's not fair. I get that. And yet at the same time, I think in Catholic and Orthodox traditions, it is the body and the blood. And there's something different in that, in that liturgy and in that theology happening. Right. But at least for me, I say, you know what? I, uh, because I can't honor that theology, I'm not going to try and, and by my taking it in your eyes, devalue that. Right. And so I'm just going to sit back and I'm going to accept it in my way. Um, yeah, because that is, yeah, so, so I mean, there, there is still, uh, and I think there always will be, in Catholic and Orthodox traditions, a belief in transubstantiation, that in the, the praying and the liturgy surrounding uh, the host, the, the Eucharist, um, that it actually turns into the literal body and blood. Mm -hmm. uh, of Christ. And that was something that, I mean, you know, whole denominations have been born out of that. Wars have been fought, people have died over, is it really Jesus's body and blood, or is it symbolic? Um, and even within the symbolic world, you know, I always, I think I've told you all the story before about uh, my first mentor in ministry, who was German Lutheran, um, and the, the elders, and he was serving a disciples church and the elders or the deacons would mess with him because he always had such a high value to the Eucharist, to, to the elements. 
that he had always sprinkle the bread out in the uh, garden after any of the leftover communion bread because it was it was holy uh, for, for the birds and squirrels. And then he would always drink the full cup that was poured for the for of, of what was supposed to be juice. But every now and again, the deacons would put wine in there and kind of <laughs> catch him off guard when he chugged that in the middle of worship. Uh, <laughs> so um, yeah, so so you know that there are all different spaces of where people lie on um, how much this matters, whether it is or is not. You know, there's a famous, sorry, super geeky, but there's a famous uh, meeting in the middle of the Reformation between Martin Luther and uh, Zwingli, who started kind of a Calvinist um, branch off, and, uh, or sorry, Anabaptist. And, and anyways, they were, they met in this pub for like weeks having theological arguments. And the thing they kept coming back to was uh, Matthew 26, 26. Um, this is my body. Um, and so <laughs> at one point, they, they kept going back to whether it was real or whether it was symbolic. And at one point, uh, at one point, Zwingli just carved into the table <clears throat> with his knife, uh, Hulk est corpus, uh, this is my body. And so every time Luther would try and argue that it was a symbolic thing, Zwingli would just point at the table where he had carved into the table, this is my body. Uh, and so for him, that was a really important thing. Um, so while we're in this high moment of communion in this you know, let's, let's just talk just a sec more, like, because disciples, like, this is the core of our theology. This is, this is it. This is that, this is that theological glue that holds us together. So what is it that's happening in communion? What do you think is happening there with Jesus and the disciples? And what is it, why does it matter to you? Or does it matter to you? <clears throat> I, it doesn't matter because he's connecting with his uh, disciples. And uh, later on, they'll, <clears throat> they'll spread the word as to what happened. So then Jesus is connecting with the people also before he was crucified even. And so it also establishes a ritual for certain <clears throat> denominations as to what needs to be done. Yeah, and so it's not only, um, it's really one of those, I think, that kind of transcends time. Because Jesus is here in the middle of a meal that always connects people as, as the Passover, that connects the people of Israel with the redeeming works of God throughout history. But he's also speaking directly to those disciples. And, you know, when he says, I'll never drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. It's also connecting us always to the past, to the present, and to the future. Um, so it's connecting us with everything that God has done, everything that God is doing in, in, in this moment, and everything that God will do, uh, all the liberating and unifying acts that God will do in the future. And Paul talks a lot about this. First Corinthians is so much because that was a community that really struggled with what it meant to be united as one body of Christ. And what was, and they were struggling with, so what's the point of this communion? Um, you know, I, well, in those days it was an agape feast. It was a full meal. Um, good old potluck meets communion. So um, yeah, so, so this is a really important moment. Any other stories or thoughts about what this means in your life? Well, and I've said, you know, you all, we say it continually that we grow up Baptist and, and in the Baptist tradition, you don't do it every week. Um, so that's something we've had to, to kind of get accustomed to in the Disciples of Christ. Um, but even, even, you know, it was still a ritual thing because you, you pretty much, it was either done monthly or quarterly or, you know, um, but even then, you know, I think as a child, 
uh, you know, and when I was growing up, you know, it was kind of like nobody takes communion unless you've accepted Christ as your savior. Nobody does that. Um, and so it would be like, never seen them walk the aisle. Are you sure they, you know, I mean, so it, it used to get to be this thing. And it's like, instead of it being what it should have been, you know, sometimes it got to be a legalistic thing, you know, and, and then the verses of, you know, you can't take it if you haven't, you know, prayed all your sins away, you know, and da, 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 da. And so, yeah, I think I grew up with more of a legalistic view of communion than, than it being what we partake of now in the Disciple of Christ Church. So. Well, and Diane, I find it so funny because I think you're right. I mean, that, that it is easy when we have rituals and liturgy to be able to create rules and regulations around it and, and it can become legalistic. It's ironic though, because the source of the biblical source for that legalism comes not from Jesus, but it comes from Paul. Yeah. Uh, and, and Paul, who often was writing to, to, uh, to Gentiles to say like, uh, you, you don't have to let the, don't, don't let the law and the legalism get in the way of God's grace that we know through Jesus. Like, don't, don't get hung up on legalism. Right. But yet, because Paul has that about, you know, if, if you come to the table uh, without being reconciled to your brother and sister, uh, or, or uh, you know, you're, you're drinking your own damnation. Uh, it's always... I had a Presbyterian, uh, or trying to think, I think, yeah, she was Presbyterian, Presbyterian girlfriend in seminary, and she was like, I just can't get behind you disciples, you're drinking your own damnation, <laughs> that was always her thing, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that didn't work out, that wasn't Caitlin, uh, <laughs> but um but yeah, so it is ironic that that it's Paul's words uh, that ends up becoming those those barriers for some. And I think there is I think there's a healthy balance that we need to be aware of. Like, what an amazing thing that we really are being connected to all Christians in all times and places to the liberative acts of God throughout history and connecting us to the future of all that God will do. Um, it's a beautiful, challenging thing, and that it takes place right before Jesus' crucifixion, right in the middle of a difficult season. Um, but it's similar in the same way as, as we started by remembering that this Last Supper took place in the middle of a Passover, in the middle of this remembrance that even in a difficult season, um, God, God, God carried people through. You know, that's the whole reason why. Um, does anybody, does anybody remember why? So Passover is also called the festival of unleavened bread. Why, why didn't they have leaven? Back in Egypt, does anybody remember? Yeah, they had to, I don't remember the details. They didn't have, they didn't they have, didn't have yeast. Didn't have yeast. Was Ron, I think you're onto something. And Carly, what were you saying? She Let's said they made Ron bread because so that it would be ready to go. They made it without leaven. Yeah. That's it. Because Passover was like meant, it was like, hey, you're in the middle of packing up and fleeing for your lives. You are leaving behind everything that is not essential and you're going to get just enough and this bread is going to have to last you for this dangerous journey so you don't have the luxury of sitting around and waiting for it to rise and you know doing all this stuff you just got to be ready this is this is travel food this is this is the kind of stuff that you need to be ready as you are becoming refugees and migrants this is you know this is the the hey this is just enough to get by for today does it like the hard tack and the yeah, <laughs> yes yes i think that's a great analogy that's a great analogy oh my gosh we could geek out about uh communion elements for the rest of the day and a few more but uh let's let's keep going 
Um, because Peter's story that happens in the midst of this is one that's always told. I want to, I'll, I'll just jump in here and read just 10 verses. Um, Peter's story and, and Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, so we're in Matthew 26, verses 31 through 41. Then Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Though all become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. <laughs> then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet it's not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so you couldn't stay awake with me just for one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into this time of trial. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And, and then it goes on. And so, you know, we'll hear, uh, we won't hear it today, but you can read on that, uh, you know, this happens two other times. Again, Jesus has to chastise them, and again and again, I don't know, maybe they had too much wine at Passover, I don't know what it was, but they're, they, they don't stay with them, and Peter indeed does go on uh, and denies Jesus three times and, and becomes aware of it at the end of this chapter. So why is Peter's story always told? Why does his denial matter? Same to you. I think it matters to us you, you bet. because we relate to that. I think our own perspective makes it matter a lot. I mean, that's separate from why it matters and it was included in the scripture, but I think for us, we, we can relate. And so it's kind of poignant for us. I think that's great because, I mean, how many times have we had really well-meaning, you know, we've told a friend, hey, no matter what, I am there for you. And then we're not. Um, and it's, it's not because we're evil. It's not because we're, you know, malevolent or anything like that. It, it's, um, there was a famous ethics book uh, looking at the rise of Nazi Germany, and it's called The Banality of Evil. Uh, just saying that like, just little seemingly inconsequential things. You know, it's like, what is it? The, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like that. We all carry that. We all have things where we've fallen short of our hopes, even what we know is right, even what we're ready to profess as what we will do. And sometimes we just don't. Sometimes we just don't. Um, but there's a reason why Peter's story continues on and why this isn't the end of Peter's story. So keep that in the back of your mind as, as, as we continue on. And I think that's also one of the reasons why the Gospel of John is one of those that's almost always read at Easter because it's, it's, you know, that's the one where we have Jesus turning to Peter and at the, you know, he makes him another meal, almost like another communion, and then uh, at the seaside, and then he, he tells him three times to feed my sheep. You know, Peter, do you love me? Um, in the same way that Peter denies him three times, Jesus gives him three times to make it right. Um, and so we see that, that, that model of denial and um, forgiveness uh, and grace extended by Jesus. And I think not just in the denial, but just the fact that the disciples just, they weren't there for him when they needed to be the most. And I think about our own lives, like you were saying, so many times 
there are things out there that we could be doing for him or to love him or to show our love for him. And we get too involved in other things or we're too busy or, oh, I meant to do that or, you know, and this whole Black Lives Matter and all the, everything that's going on right now, you know, it's just easier just to go to sleep, <laughs> you know, than to get out there and really do something. Oh my Lord, that is so true. And there are so many easy ways for us to, 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 to go to sleep. Yeah. Yeah, there are so many ways to get distracted and to not make um, those moments of priority. And to also give ourselves some grace that like, even if Jesus' closest friends couldn't always do it, like, yeah. it's okay. And Jesus was able to create a little thing called Christianity out of them, you know, like, it'll be enough. Yeah. Um, but let's talk just a bit about Jesus' prayer. What's What's significant for you uh, about this? Again, this is one of those that's in all the Gospels. Um, I think it's Luke, where Jesus, where it says that Jesus, or maybe maybe it's in John, where it starts talking about Jesus uh, uh, sweating blood. Um, but the, the 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 Gospel writers are trying to show us this is, you know, Jesus has been praying throughout the Gospels, but this is this is this is game time. This is crunch time. Um, so what is we get to see the human side of him here. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, we know what that kind of prayer is like when you've been in, you know, really hard situations. And I, I think it's a good reminder, you know, because, because I, I, or I, I would challenge, I'd not challenge, but just to say that, like, I hope, that our prayer lives are there in those hard seasons, that we feel comfortable praying. But I'll say, if anything of 10 years of ministry has taught me anything, it's that so many of us carry around some sort of, like, some sort of idea of faith and of our relationship to God that so many wonderful, beautiful, faithful people I know don't feel like they can take that fear or that anger to God, that when they're in those really, really hard times, that's when their prayer lives just go away. Um, and so I, I think this is a really good reminder that in those urgent moments, you know, we just have to double down on our prayers. Yeah. And, and what is, so what about Jesus's words to you? <clears throat> How, how do you see this? Is there anything that teaches us about the, the content of our prayers or the, or the form of, of our prayers? What do you see in that? Well, just the not my will. <laughs> I don't understand this. I don't want to do it. This is scaring me. But your will is sovereign, I mean. Yeah, the, the format was kind of to put your concerns, your fears, lay them out, like Diane was saying, lay them out, you know, um, don't be afraid to do that. God wants to hear that. And yet, um, not what I think, but or not my will, but yours. Yeah, I like that format. And that's a scary, that's a hard thing. Because those prayers, I think, seem to be needed most when I think our human nature, I think we so often, it's so easy to want to try and get back some control. You know, it's usually those moments that we feel so out of control that it's so tempting just to say, God, I need you to follow through on this. I need you to help me out. I know what's right. I know what I need here. Just make it happen. And then that's usually where we go into some kind of bargaining. <laughs> you know, you do this, and then I'll make sure to show up every Sunday, or I'll, I'll make sure to pray every day, or, you know, whatever it is. For me, there is a release and a comfort in saying, not my will, but yours. It's kind of like, okay, I don't have to worry about this. Any case, sera, sera, what will be, will be, you know, and it's, it's 
lifting of the burden somewhat. Absolutely. And, and I, I want us to remember this because um, Jesus's prayer is so important. And, and Dan, what you just said about, because when we can trust in God enough, then we know, you know, there isn't, there isn't a lot that we have control of in this world. But if we trust that God is good and that God will see us through, even if it's in ways that we have no idea what that looks like, you're right. It can be freeing, but we know that God is there with us, uh, that God, Emmanuel, you know, that God is there. Because we're going to see something really interesting as such an undersell uh, next week, because we're going to be looking Matthew's <laughs> account of Jesus' crucifixion is very unique. Um, and so we'll see, we'll come back to this prayer next week. Um, I, but I just want to, I just want to kind of skim if you didn't have a chance to, to finish up um, this chapter. Um, so just notice that after the, the prayer and the three times of the praying, then there's Judas uh, arriving uh, with the soldiers and that he kisses him as the symbol. Uh, you know, he, he greets him. Uh, and and it's so interesting. I mean, you have this this act of intimacy and love, um, and and it's for you know horrible reasons why Judas kisses Jesus. Um, and to note that in early Christian uh, in early Christian practices, they had a whole series of, of written out of what to do when somebody had transgressed and was out of the community, a way to work them back in. And the final step, you know, we call it today the passing of the peace, but, um, but it was actually for uh, uh, the end step of reconciliation with somebody who was out of the community. And it wasn't a, like a handshake or a hug, but the passing of the peace, it was actually a passing of the, the kiss of peace. And so each time Christians would participate in this, uh, it was meant to kind of uh, undo uh, everything that Judas did to kissing uh, through, through that act. Um, so we have that going on. Uh, and, then, and then some of Jesus's closest try and respond to the violence, the impending violence, with violence. Um, and Jesus says, you know, put your sword away. Um, and, and, and he says, you know, in verse 53, do you not think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? Um, you know, so he's, so he is, he is modeling what will become so important for, um, for nonviolent, uh, direct resistance, um, peaceful resistance, and showing that that it is important to maintain your nonviolence even in the face uh, of of violence. Um, which, by the way, if uh, I don't know if you've seen it on Facebook, I posted a great thing noting that today is Veterans Day, um, and so grateful for all the veterans. Um, Ron, yourself included, and, and, and I just think um, there's a great little reflection from SALT Project that I posted on my Facebook page that reminds us that when it was first started, when Veterans Day, you know, it started as Armistice Day, um, that was meant to also not only remember the veterans and remember those who had died, but also to promote a time of peace where we wouldn't need uh, war, where we wouldn't need, uh, feel the need to respond with violence. Um, and so, you know, Jesus is encouraging his disciples here to not respond with violence. Um, and then there's this kangaroo court uh, that Jesus ends up getting, uh, you know, what court is held in the middle of the night on Passover? Um, none, none. This is, this is a sham. It's a setup, you know, the gospel writers are just really trying to say, and they can't even, they can't find witnesses. 
they can't agree on what's happening and it ends up Jesus gets accused of blasphemy. Um, and then and then the chapter ends with Peter recognizing his own denial. And that's where we're going to have to leave it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and next week's going to be another difficult, I'm so grateful for you all having the courage and the vulnerability of going through these, um, these difficult texts. Um, you know, we always joke in clergy circles that like, there's a reason why everybody loves Palm Sunday and Easter, but you can never get anybody to show up to Good Friday services. <laughs> uh, you know, we don't like, we don't like to go to the cross. Um, and we don't like to think about it. We don't, um, we don't want to be there um, for good reason. But uh, I think it's important that we do. And so next week we will. And next week's another one where we're just going to read a small section. Uh, I think it's kind of the pivotal moments. Um, but we, we will skip next week the first 32 verses of chapter 27. We won't start until we get to verse 33 next week. So, um, so we will we will go to the cross with Jesus next week. Um, yeah. Whew. Y'all have been great this week. Uh, Ron, I, I meant to ask, how's is, is Sherry doing okay? Just sleeping? Just tired today? Uh, she's got backache, and headache, and neck ache. And she thought she could get it solved by going to the <clears throat> massage therapist. And it's just acting up on her. And she just... She didn't go to bed till 6.15 this morning. Oh, lovely. Yeah. It, it, <clears throat> she can't take ibuprofen because it knocks down your immune system. So she doesn't want to take any chances. So I just got to live with it. <clears throat> Is there anything we can do to, to help you be nurse and partner? No. I, don't know. I think I got it under control so far. <laughs> I'm not sure <laughs> for how long, but I, I got it under control. <laughs> Well, um, you know you've got you know you've got church family and you know you got a pastor who cares too. So if you guys need anything, don't don't hesitate to holler. So. Will do. I, I got a guy that helps me uh, go shopping from VA, so kind of a I need a bath aid, make sure I don't slip and fall in the shower. <laughs> Nobody so. needs that. Not this year. 2020's had enough losses. We don't need anything yeah. else. Thanks. Well, not to 24 seven yet. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Oh, um, would anybody like to close us out with a little bit of prayer? I'm not going to volunteer that, but I would just like to ask, I'm, I just got out of a staff meeting with the, the team of people at the museum and one of my colleagues, um, just found out this week that her husband has cancer in his jaw mm -hmm. um, and he's having some surgery and reconstructive surgery this week or maybe she said next week but right away um she and he are in my eyes at least fairly i guess they're not fairly young they're in their their 30s 40s That's young. um but they have a young son who's maybe 10, um, but she was visibly and clearly um, upset and, and taken by this. I think it came quite unexpectedly for them. So if we could just pray for them, the family, and particularly her husband, that would be great. And I will not um, say her name just for her privacy because she clearly could be found on our internet, but um, just pray for that family. Absolutely. And, and we, we just found like, that, oh, I was just going to say, we just found out too, Cheryl, we, in all this talking, we found out Cheryl works, she's the chef where Lyle Marsden, at, um, <laughs> yeah, she's in social work and, and we were just, she said, oh yeah, I know him, but anyway, she was saying they do have a case there and they're really cracking. I mean, they're, they're like putting all kinds of restrictions. So we just need to remember him too, because I mean, it's, it's like now they don't want 
um, people, they're, they're delivering their meals. They're not allowed to come get their meals. I mean, so we just, you know, but it was really, it was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. That's Lyle. Yeah. She said, I knew I knew his name, but anyway, um, but she's really concerned about it spreading. So, you know, that's, yeah. Really and, and not only for Lyle, but for, for all of us. Yeah. This is, this is really, really, really bad. bad right now. Um, so Carly, I was just going to ask, is it okay for us to, of course, without putting her name, but to add her to the prayer list? Is that okay? Please, please do. I would, I would appreciate that. I, I don't, I think I've had, I've heard her have conversations that I think they are fairly atheistic in their belief mm. system. Um, so, you know, on a couple of fronts. Um, it would be good to remember them. Well, it doesn't matter. Yeah, right. right, exactly. Yeah, ab absolutely. But I, but I also hear what you're saying, Carly, too. But like, they for many of us, we... Prayer support in their lives. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'll offer to pray. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Heavenly Father, we just thank you again for... Um, this beautiful day and um, the beautiful rain coming out of the trees, it's just melting ice and it's just so good to see your glory in that. Um, Father, we thank you for this time on Wednesday mornings that we can just get together as a small group and, and, and study your word. And we thank you for the technology that can allow that even. Um, Father, I do want to pray for Carly's coworker and um, for Lyle in particular, um, and for Sherry today, those that we, we know and love, um, and so many more that are just being affected by so many things these days. Um, and Lord, I just want to just, just quote that scripture that the, the spirit is willing and our flesh is so weak. And we just pray that you will make us strong and just abide in you and, and let you abide in us so that our spirits can be strong. We just pray um, for the safety, Father, of these here that are gathered with us and the safety of our loved ones in um, just Lincoln, Nebraska, Father, and what we're, we're uh, facing and going through and the nation, oh my gosh, the nation that is just um, just my fears every day. And I just have to give you the, give it to you and know that you are sovereign and, and we're just going to trust in that and love you. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Yeah. Good day. I'm not going to cry. <laughs> You're okay. You're okay. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.